Hello there. Good morning to you. Here we are, ready for this week's lesson together. Uh, I hope everybody's fine and doing well. Uh, we're, we're praying for you. Uh, Beverly and I pray for our, our class every day. Uh, we're uh, both excited and looking forward to October 4th when we come back together in our classroom again. And uh, we really hope that all of you will come. Um, we've uh, been studying Second Timothy. We've uh, been in chapter 3. And last week I got through verse 11. So I'm picking up this morning verse 12 uh, there in your Bibles. Uh, Paul says, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Two truths. Those that live godly lives, meaning it's possible, will be persecuted. The result will be persecution. Uh, this is a word from the Apostle Paul. It's also a word uh, that the Lord Jesus shared with us. If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. Uh, Peter, in 1 Peter 4, 4, says, Don't think it's strange if uh, they persecute you. Uh, it's it's truth. It's to be expected. It is normal for a Christian living a godly life. And, uh, you know, I'm very well aware uh, that here in the United States, so far, uh, the physical trial by fire has not happened to Christians, but I'm not going to be surprised that it comes. Uh, it is uh, going on at this present time in many places around the world. Uh, in China, in the Middle East, in Africa, it's, it's intense for Christian brothers and sisters there. Uh, their very lives are at stake. You know, I, I ran across this week a, a list, the five steps of persecution. Uh, as I read this little list to you, you just visualize the United States and where we are. Uh, see if you can identify what, which level we're at. Number one, for persecutors now, all of this, identify the target group. Number two, marginalize the target group. Number three, vilify the target group. Number four, pass laws against the beliefs or activities of the target group. And then number five, enforce those laws. Uh, we're in it. The United States is in a gradual progression, step by step by step, to persecute Christians in this country. So don't think it's strange. Uh, don't wring your hands and say, oh my goodness, this is not like it was when I was young, and things like that. No, it's normal, and it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's a blessing. The United States has not experienced what most of the world has throughout church history. Uh, and that's a fact. Now he says in verse 13, while evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Uh, a category of people here that the Apostle Paul himself says are evil. Uh, we need to acknowledge that there are evil people. Evil is real. It exists. It's, uh, it's taught in all of the scripture that evil is present in our world and we need not explain it away or minimalize it as if it's uh, some sort of, you know, social phenomena, uh, just some, some part of our culture. No, God calls things evil when they're evil and we need to also. Now, they're evil and they are imposters. They're, they're, they're presenting themselves as somebody that they are not. And it's going to go from bad to worse. Now, last week, uh, I, I said to you that the picture of the last days is not one of uh, a rose garden. It is a picture of evil getting worse and worse until the moment that Christ comes for us and takes us out of this world. Uh, here, Paul's reaffirming that. He's teaching it again, that uh, there's going to be evil people, they're going to be imposters, and they're going to do everything in their power to persecute the church and to deceive Christian people. Uh, 
these two kinds of people, evil and imposters, they're going to go uh, from bad to worse, he says. We need to be on our guard and not be surprised. It's a thing that's, uh, that's happening now in our culture and in our world. Uh, worldwide, it's happening uh, where uh, truth in God, honor of God, worship of God is mocked. You know, one of the things I've noticed in, in these riots that are going on in our country right now, you know, it started out rioting against the police. But uh, just in the last couple of weeks, they have been burning Bibles. And their shouts, uh, which, you know, I try not to even listen to the videos of their shouts, but they're blaspheming Christ now. Uh, they're, they're screaming and yelling against, of course, the police. But then they're, they're blaspheming Jesus and cursing him, uh, which just shows you what Paul's talking about here. It's, it's, they're going to get worse and worse as time goes on. Uh, but Paul says in verse 14, he's talking to this young man, Timothy, here. Uh, I'm going to read 14 and 15 together, and then we'll stop and open them up a little bit. He says, but as for you, Timothy, continue in what you've learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you've believed it or learned it uh, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, very interesting, very interesting here. Paul is talking to Timothy and telling him that you need to remember where you learned the truth, where the, whoever that was, uh, how you came to firmly believe and trust in Christ, and yet you need to know from whom you learned it. And uh, one of the topics that, that uh, ever so often in our, Beverly and I, when we pray, comes up, we, we thank God for the people in our life that way back in childhood uh, taught us and uh, led us to accept Christ and we were saved. We, we remember them and we thank God for them. And it doesn't just stop there. Uh, we, we remember and we pray for and we thank God for all the people throughout our life that have been instrumental in us to teach us and help us come along. And I think that ought to be a topic for all of our prayers. Uh, someday, perhaps, uh, when the scroll of history is, is rolled and uh, we're able to review our lives and, uh, in heaven, I think that we're going to see the work of God throughout our life to teach us, to lead us to faith, to, to disciple us as we go through our life. And Lord knows the times God has moved in our life to protect us from, from harm and danger and, and from falling and from straying away. I think we're all going to see that one day, and we'll give God the glory for that. Uh, he says to Timothy here, you've known the truth since uh, you were a child, uh, the Holy Scriptures. Now, we know uh, earlier in Timothy, uh, we were told that Timothy's mother was a, was a Christian and his grandmother, and they're the ones Paul's talking about here. Paul knew them and he's telling Timothy, remember your mom and remember your grandma, uh, how they led you to faith by teaching you the scriptures, the sacred writings, as he calls it there. Uh, and they make you, notice he says, the, the scripture, the Bible, you've got it right there in front of you, don't you? The sacred writings is what it is. He says, they make you wise for salvation. Uh, so here's the deal. Uh, we are saved in a moment of time. When we trust in Christ and turn from our sins, we are saved. We are born again at that moment. Uh, now, Timothy's already saved. We know that. He's a pastor uh, and, and doing fine. But what Paul's talking about here for salvation is, is the fact that salvation is more than the moment you trusted Christ. It goes on throughout the rest of your life until the day that Christ appears. It's progressive. Uh, it's, it's something that continues on 
and we always experience it. But it makes us wise for salvation. Uh, now, we can be wise in many things. Uh, we can be wise about how to fix cars. Or we can be wise about how to make money. We can be wise about how to be healthy. We can be wise about how we cook. Uh, we can be wise about computers. But are we also wise about salvation? This is the most important wisdom that you can have. And it comes from the sacred scriptures. It comes from the word of God. Uh, is the word of God your source daily uh, for wisdom? The wisdom that pertains to knowing Christ and, and progressing through your life step by step uh, to be more and more like Jesus as you go. Salvation has often been described as uh, being three things, three steps, three phases. Uh, we are saved in the past tense. That's when you trusted in Christ. Uh, when we realize that Jesus died on the cross for my sin, uh, that he never sinned, he was innocent, but he took my sin and he was willing to provide a, a substitute sacrifice on the cross for me that I should have been on the cross. I, I deserve to be on the cross, but I didn't go to the cross because he did for me in my place. That's past tense. Uh, there's the present tense that we're living in. This present tense of salvation is what we're talking about today and what we're living today. It's, it's what Paul says in Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. That's what we're living today. That's why church today is important. Because when we gather at church and we are taught and we fellowship and we correct and live life together, uh, we are experiencing the truth right now that we are saved, that there's no condemnation to us anymore. And the future tense of salvation is when, guess what, the Lord Jesus with a shout, descends from the heavens with the trump of God, and we are caught up in the air to be with him, uh, and we will be changed in a moment of time, Paul says. Our bodies will be eradicated of our old sin nature that lives in us now and fights against us. We'll be completed. We'll be like him because we'll see him. He's going to change you. Uh, he's going to take away the struggle against sin. It's going to happen. And that's the future tense of what we're looking for. Uh, now, this, this instance, this application here, 14 and 15, uh, Paul's talking to Timothy and he's reminding him of his mother, mother and what she did for him. She's somebody that taught him, led him to believe in verse 14, and then completed his life to, from whom you've learned it. Timothy, uh, after his conversion, was able to learn from his mother and grandmother and progress in the faith. Okay, we're getting to my favorite part right now. Verse uh, 16. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Uh, Paul, in verses 14 and 15, referred to the sacred writings for Timothy. Now he's going to open up these sacred writings. He's going to talk about the scriptures, about the Bible. You have it there in front of you, I assume. Where did it come from? Why do you have it? Is it, is it a book just like any other book? Is it uh, important that you know it, that you study it? Good questions, right? Let me, let me help you with that because that, this is what Paul's going to teach right here to us. Number one, all scripture, all of it, all of it 
not parts of it. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable. Uh, this is the doctrine of the inspiration of scripture. Uh, Paul is showing us right here that, the, that God is the source of the scripture that you hold there in front of you. It didn't come from men. Men were used by God to write it, but its source is from eternity. It's from God. Uh, that's an important thing to hang on to and remember in the times that we live in. It says that it's God breathed. It's breathed out by God. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is the author of Scripture. And the concept here is that it is breathed out by God through men who penned the words that they were given or breathed into by the Holy Spirit. And then its result is that it's profitable. You know, the, the Word of God, the Bible, is something that uh, we believe in its original autographs. The first time it was written was uh, perfect, inerrant, and absolutely re reliable. Now, we don't have those original autographs now, and people might say, and they do say, well, if you don't have the original, uh, how do we know you haven't changed it? Well, we do know, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna share that with you here as I go along. Uh, our copy that we have today is 100% reliable, and it's not in question in any part of any importance. Um, there have been attempts through the uh, 2,000 years of church history to eradicate the Bible. Uh, you know, I'm so, I'm so thankful to the Baptists uh, in church history. I, I, I love church history, and I've read, read it a lot. And one of the hallmarks of Baptists, uh, which makes me proud to be one, is they're called people of the book. Uh, they have historically fought for, died for, and maintain the Word of God through hundreds of years of church history. Uh, there's a dividing line that uh, exists today between those that believe the Bible's a book from God, like I've just taught you, or it's just a great book written by men. Uh, that is a, a thing that exists in our culture. Uh, I was taught it in the seminary, for instance, I was taught that the Bible is not the Word of God. It contains the Word of God. And it just shocked me to my toes. I remember going home to Beverly uh, after after class that day and saying, I, I think I've made a mistake coming here. Uh, I didn't know they believed like that. But God, God kept me there, and uh, they didn't get me. You know, uh, I went around that and uh, was able to maintain my, my faith. Uh, but nobody can, let me just talk about the Bible. Nobody can deny the greatness of the Bible. It's completely unique among all the books ever written. It's unique in the, the continuity over thousands of years. Uh, it was written over 1,600 years. Uh, when you look at Genesis to Revelation, 1,600 years. Uh, it was written over 60 generations of people. There are more than 40 authors of the scripture. They were written on three different continents in different circumstances and places, different times, different moods. It was written in three languages, and it all speaks together in one unified story and voice. And that is the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Uh, it's unique in its translation. It was the first book ever to be translated, and it's been translated into more languages than any other book in existence and continues so today. There are several ministries today whose sole purpose is to translate the scripture into every language group in the world, and they're doing a great job of it. 
The Bible's unique because it's a, it's a survival matter. It has survived time. It has survived persecution. It has survived criticism. It is the Word of God. The Bible's unique, too, because of its honesty. It deals with the sins and failures of its heroes in a manner unknown in holy books in the world. The Bible never pulls any punches when it uh, uh, portrays d its heroes, David, Solomon, Moses. It reveals them in truth. They're, they're, they're great qualities when they walk with the Lord, but it also reveals their sin. The Bible's totally honest. And uh, most of the other holy books, their heroes are portrayed as almost gods with no faults, and that's a lie. Uh, people are always in this world, in this life, uh, uh, possessed or, or uh, composed of uh, sin, a man of sin, the old man, as Paul calls it. And the Bible's honest about that. The Bible's unique in its influence also. It's had far and away a greater influence on culture and literature than any other book in existence. Hands down, there is no comparison to any other book. Uh, it's a unique book <clears throat> inspired by God. But the, to me, the most, uh, the most uh, holy and uh, attention-grabbing, compelling uh, reason that the Bible, to me, is the Word of God, is prophecy. Uh, prophecy. There's no other book in the world that has thousands of statements by God in the past talking about the future and what's going to happen that 100% of them have become true other than the Bible. Uh, I like uh, something Peter said one time, uh, 2 Peter 1.19, <clears throat> and uh, it's very important to me. You know, remember Peter, okay? Peter's the one that walked with Jesus for three years. He's the one that went up on the Mount of Transfiguration and saw Jesus transformed into his glory. Uh that would make you tend to think, if gosh, if I saw something like that, I'd believe, oh my goodness, and nobody could ever rattle my faith. Uh, but I want to show you something Peter said. He said, <clears throat> we also have the prophetic word made more sure, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place. Uh, Peter said, the prophecies of the Bible are more sure than what he experienced in his personal life walking with Christ. He understood that God is the one that, that speaks of the end from the beginning, that he is able to tell us in prophecy uh, what is going to happen in the future, and he's never wrong. They're always true. I believe uh, for any serious student of the Bible, that you need to focus on prophecy because prophecy just happens to be the Lord's method of proving the scripture to you, proving that it was written outside of time and space in eternity by a holy and righteous God who's going to wrap up this this time that we live in and bring it to a conclusion where every knee will bow to the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> there are 332 Old Testament prophecies about Jesus coming, which he fulfilled perfectly. His birth in Bethlehem, his emergence from Egypt, his healing of the sick, his death on the cross, you name it, it's covered. The culmination of all these prophecies coming true is overwhelming proof that the Bible is breathed out by God and it's profitable for us. <clears throat>
You know, some people say, well, there's some errors in the Bible because people copied it wrong. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, we have thousands of early manuscripts of the scriptures, thousands of them, more than any other book in history, more, more than the Iliad, the Odyssey, any other ancient book, by far there is no comparison. And the culmination of looking at all those manuscripts and portions of the scripture that we have and the Dead Sea Scrolls, we are able to say that not more than one one thousandth of the text of the Bible is in question. And of those, not one of them pertains to any doctrine. The Old Testament is even more impressive than that. And here's the main thing. It's true. The Bible is true. It is a, a book of many wonders and prophecies. It is a book that changes lives. Now, we can't say that about other books. We, we can't say that the Bible, I mean, that any other book changes lives like the Bible does. There are literally millions of lives that have been changed and broken homes restored and broken lives that have been restored by the Bible, by reading the words of God and taking them into their heart. It's a book that Paul says elsewhere is alive, and it's sharp, sharper than a two-edged sword. The Bible is true, and therefore it changes lives. It's a book that was written by the one that created life, and he tells us how life is to be lived, and when we do it, it's true. It corresponds with truth, and it changes all of our life. Now, the second part of that verse, it says it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Um, so very simply, uh, right here, we've got an understanding of what the Bible does for us. If you'll, if you'll take it up and read it and study it and meditate on it, uh, it does four things for you. Uh, <clears throat> doctrine. It gives you truth. Doctrine is truth. It's propositional statements about who God is, who you are, and what life is about. Reproof, that, that's when somebody comes and corrects you when you're off course and you get a reproof for correction. Likewise, uh, when we're walking astray, or when we put place value on something that's not of God, it corrects us. And then finally, instruction in righteousness, what that is, that teaches us how to live, uh, how to get up and go through your day, each day of your life, and get instruction in righteousness. What is it that God wants of me? What does he expect of me each day? Well, the Bible teaches us that so that we're not, we're not in the dark. The Bible is infallible. It's never wrong. It's inerrant. There are no errors in the scripture. Uh, we find in the scripture something that we find nowhere else in our life. And I, I like to think of it, and I believe I'm correct, that in the absence of the physical presence of Jesus Christ, that God has given us his written word in order to get us through this life. I think it should be central to the life of every Christian. It's made to be written, I mean, to be read by everyone, including children. It is a, a book that God has given us in this last days to get us through and cause us to triumph. Uh, and to persevere. One day, 
the one who is called Jesus. Revelation teaches us he's coming back on a white horse, and on his thigh are the words written, Word of God. Jesus is the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He's coming back. Until that day, the, the written Word of God that you hold there in your hands is to be your source of strength and information to get you through until the appearing of Jesus Christ. Now, he says in verse 17, all, you know, we've just talked about the Word of God. You, you've got it. You know what it's for. And here's this, verse 17. That the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. There you are. That's why you have the Scriptures. That's why you have the sacred writings. Uh, that you might be complete uh, and equipped for every good work. Uh, when we, when we come to God with the Bible in our lap, reading his words and praying them and uh, talking to the Lord about it, God changes us. We will become complete. Now, some translations say perfect. Uh, I think that's unfortunate. Uh, the Greek word means complete. Uh, it means to be the very best that you can be at this stage of your life, of your walk with Christ. You can have everything that you need. God does not withhold truth from us. Uh, at whatever stage in your walk that you are, whether you're a new believer or you've been at it for decades, the Word of God will never cease to speak to you to make you complete in your walk with Christ. It's, it's, a, it's a book that never becomes uh, dead. Uh, I've been personally, and there's some of you I know can say, can exceed what I'm going to say. I've been reading it uh, for over 60 years. And uh, I read it over and over again. And I, I never cease to have this happen to me that I'll be reading the Word of God and a truth jumps out at me that I've, I've never realized personally before. Well, uh, it's not that I haven't read it before. It's that at that particular moment, the Holy Spirit that lives in me, he indwells me. It's at that moment that he uh, illumines that verse of Scripture to me and teaches me something that I needed to know. Uh, that's why the book is alive. It's quick and it's powerful. All right. It's a, it's a spiritual book. Think of it as a spiritual book. Uh, it's a spiritual blessing that God gives you. The Word of God is given to us that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work, he says there in verse 17. You know, I don't understand all this. <laughs> I, I don't, but I know it's true. It's what the Bible teaches us that it is. Uh, sometimes uh, I feel like that it's because of a lack of study of the Word of God that most Christians are experiencing the trouble that they are. Uh, I, I believe this with all my heart, you know, that, that, that when we get to heaven and... We're at the judgment seat of Christ, and we're going to be judged by Christ for reward. Um, I can't help but believe that part of the conversation of judgment for us is going to be how much time and attention we personally gave to the study of the Word of God. It's like in this meantime, this end time, this, light, this age of the church that we're in, <clears throat> when Jesus is in heaven instead of being down here with us, that he's given us the Bible. He's given us his word. And that we, we let it accumulate dust on the shelf rather than 
letting it be our spiritual food uh, and going through it and, and reading it and meditating on it, it would be such a disappointment, I think, to Christ uh, because it's the means of spiritual food that he's given us in this time that we live. And therefore, I believe everyone, everyone should be a student of the word of God. Uh, allow it to change you. It's a spiritual book. I ran across kind of a cute story. Someone wrote a letter to the newspaper and it said, over the years, I suppose I've gone to church more than a thousand times. And I can't remember the specific content of even one sermon over those years. What good was it to go to church a thousand times? And the next week, somebody wrote back a letter to the newspaper and they said, over the past many years, I have eaten more than a thousand meals prepared by my wife. And I can't remember the specific menu of it, one of those meals. But they nourished me along the way, and without them, I would be a much different man. Well, uh, that's not maybe a perfect illustration, but it is true. It does sort of illustrate the fact that only God knows who you would be were it not for the Word of God, the Bible, the sacred scriptures. Uh, we talked about people that have been instrumental in our life to bring us to faith. Well, we can also talk about the moments that the Holy Spirit has taught you from the Bible over the course of your life, and it's made you into the man or the woman that you are. It's, it's, it's something we just cannot fathom nor imagine, but I'm firmly convinced it's the source of our spiritual food in this life, and it needs to be central in our daily life. No matter what we're into, the Word of God, study of it, needs to be important. It says you'll be equipped for every good work. Every good work. What does that mean? That means that everything that God has intended for your life to be, every, every, uh, every part of the will of God for your life in this time, your, your earthly life, the word of God can complete you, make you the person you ought to be, and it will equip you and give you everything that you need for every good work that the Lord intended when he created you. Well, that wraps up chapter three. So we're going to stop here. And uh, next week, we'll start on second Timothy chapter four. And I'll look forward to being with you at that time. Father, we pray this morning to uh, lift up your name. And uh, we lift up your word. And we thank you, God, for giving us such a wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, gift a gift that can change us and equip us and get us through uh, this evil world we live in. We thank you for all those that have gone before us, that have translated it, and that have given up their lives many times, have been uh, have paid the ultimate sacrifice as martyrs for providing the word of God to us. Father, I pray to ask that you'll ever increase our attention to the, the Bible and the help that it offers us. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen.